1889. Pablo Picasso is eight. The Eiffel Tower has just gone up. And Bierstadt's The Last of the Buffalo is rejected from the Universal Exposition in Paris. Well, you might say, so it should have been. The picture is a lie. It puts the blame for the extermination of the buffalo on the Plains Indians instead of white Americans. And yet you can't help feeling a tad sorry for Bierstadt, who was helpless in the current of cultural fashion and soon to be swept away, like his subject matter. Nobody painted these scenes. They were left to the camera. Soon the buffalo were gone, wiped out as a matter of government policy by professionals with Sharps rifles who were out to destroy the Plains Indians' food base and turn them into beggars. As the forests were cut down and shipped to the cities and mining ravaged the landscape, Anyone could see that there were limits to wilderness. Then America began to run out of West. But no pioneer ethos lasts forever. By the 1880s, the main index of American social reality wasn't the wilderness anymore, it was the industrial cities. Slowly at first and then inescapably, the wilderness and the West were turning into objects of nostalgia, emblems of a vanishing freedom. But of course, that only made them more popular. <laughs> The myth of the West is only too familiar to us today, and it is so firmly embedded in the culture that Americans never get tired of it, even though it only lasted a few decades and ended over a century ago. Its hero is the cowboy, a kind of centaur, a living emblem of instinctive freedom. This mythic West is largely an invention, created at the end of the 19th century from a blur of fact and nostalgia. Here is Charles Schreyvogel painting a cowboy on the roof of his apartment building in New Jersey in a world of automobiles and telephones, not stagecoaches and pony express riders. And this is how the finished picture looked. Illustration is melding into movies. And it was this man who did more than any other artist to create the American cowboy and influence the movies. He was Frederick Remington. More an illustrator than a painter, Remington at the start of the 20th century was simulating a lost world of frontier fights and Indian scouts. Action painting. It clicked into place with the strenuous masculinity that his friend, President Theodore Roosevelt, was preaching from the bully pulpit of the White House. America makes itself through struggle. One of his chief themes was the image of the last stand. The Indian scouts were alerted to Custer and his movements on the plane. They zigzagged their way back, which signaled everyone that Yellow Hair and his men were ready to attack. Warriors took to their mouths. The women herded the children into the safety of the teepees. Every year in Hardin, Montana, the last stand of George Armstrong Custer is restaged a few miles from where he and his cavalrymen were wiped out by Lakota and Cheyenne tribesmen in 1876 at the Little Big Horn. A lot of people have negative stereotypes on George Armstrong Custer, and uh, we want to keep uh, bringing up these old grievances. Instead, we work together and take a bad situation and make something good out of it. Uh, take a lemon and turn it into lemonade, if you will. Well, my name is Max Dawes, and I play uh, Crazy Oars. 
What I do is I control all these warriors here. I gotta tell them to spread apart here and split in four here. When the cavalry comes, I tell them to look up there in the hill. It's kind of hard work controlling all these Indians. Was the record to list this tragedy as a military blunder? Custer and his 220 men galloped in the direction of what they thought was the village. Americans have been reenacting Custer's defeat ever since it happened. The first replay was done just a year after it by Buffalo Bill Cody in 1877, using Indians who had fought in the original battle. With Remington's help and a lot of later input from Hollywood, the last stand became a mythic American event. The root of that recurring theme of the last stand in visions of the American West is that sense of this place which is supposed to represent the future uh, also represents the doom of something. And it comes into the culture as, as a powerful symbol from the very beginning. And what it symbolizes is, the, uh, in a sense, the end of the frontier, because this is a battle in which the Indians, that marks the, the doom for the Indians as well, because Custer will be avenged. Um, it represents the defeat uh, of the frontiersmen. Custer is represented usually in a buckskin coat like, uh, like Daniel Boone. Uh, so it's his doom as well. But more than that, it was also seen as a symbol of what could happen in an industrialized uh, America if the lower orders, if the freed blacks in the South or even immigrant uh, workers in the city were to take advantage of their power as democratic citizens and try to take over the government. The last stand accorded with a deep American anxiety that in a time of massive immigration from Europe and Asia, white Anglo-Saxon America was going to lose its identity. It would be polluted, infected, subverted, and conquered by the scum of a foreign earth. Certainly it meant exactly that for Remington, a raving xenophobic bigot. To him, the solution was violence. Jews, Indians, Chinamen, Italians, Huns, he declared, rubbish of the earth. I've got some Winchesters, and when the massacring begins, I can get my share of them, and what's more, I will. In 1890, the frontier was declared officially closed. In 1893, a young professor at Wisconsin University, Frederick Jackson Turner, argued that it was in the act of going west that Americans had left their European heritage behind and created something new, and that what had been created was the distinctive American personality. frontier in the 1890s began the slow ending of an American state of mind. A century later, we see its death. What died was the idea that natural resources were infinite, that somewhere out there there was always going to be more land, another gold mine just there for the taking. Today, this seems like a distant myth. And long before the frontier closed, the focus of American art had already changed. What changed it was the growth of American cities, realism, Skepticism, science, and the power of the machine.